Amen. All right, so we went crab fishing this last weekend, and that's something that I'd never done before. And it was kind of my, uh, it's kind of my thinking on crab fishing was it was my replacement for uh, deer hunting and deer camp. So we set up crab camp this weekend, and I went crab fishing um, with the boys, and it was a, a good time. But you know, we had an interesting weekend. We had some trouble over the weekend. And you know, we went out, it was something that we had never done before. Um, but basically we went out and we were um, out on the ocean and we were crab fishing and we were doing some fishing. And we were about 25 miles offshore or off, off from the marina and we heard some clunking down in the engine room of the, of the boat. And now let me tell you something that when you're at 25 miles from the nearest harbor, that's not something that you wanna hear. Okay, you don't want to hear, you know, the rotating equipment inside the motor starting to bang around and clunk around. So, um, you know, it turned out okay. We made it home. But I just, I, as, as we took the long ride home, I had a lot of things to think about. And we had a lot of time to visit and, uh, you know, fellowship. But I had some, you know, I just did a lot of thinking. And, you know, there's a lot of lessons um, in trouble. So, you know, it was kind of interesting because after that, the last night we were there, uh, we were coming out of the... We were coming out of the camper, and uh, I had just, you know, we had gone and we were, we were camping out, you know, for the weekend. And I uh, came out of the camper and went, and the, the toilet in the camper, for some reason, you know, when you went to flush it, it just like sprayed water um, all over the place. And I got water all over my pants. And, and as I came out of the camper, I said, man, I was like, the toilet just sprayed water all over my leg. And, and Jacob just looks at me and he goes, and, and Jacob and, and Garrett and I just decided that this was the quote for the whole weekend. But Jacob just looks at me and he goes, man, he goes, because earlier, like several weeks before, we had some sewer problems, you know, and, and with something else. But Jacob goes, man, more sewer problems? He says, and I was like, I just looked at him and I said, you know what, Jacob? I said, life is one sewer problem after another. You know, so look, everything, I mean, how many times have I said to you that everything should have a teachable moment? So I just got to thinking about um, this situation this weekend and, you know, just thought to think about some biblical lessons in dealing with trouble, dealing with problems, and how we can, we can look at that from a biblical perspective. And the nice thing about, you know, reading the Bible and knowing the Bible is that when you run into things in your life, you relate that to things in the Bible and you'd be like, oh yeah, it's kind of like this and you know, there's a lesson here and there's a lesson here. There's lessons in everything, right? So look down at Matthew chapter 8 and let's just first of all look at the story that's happening in Matthew chapter 8 and just see what kind of lessons we can, we can learn from the Bible this morning on, on how to deal with problems and how to deal with trouble in our lives. Because look, you're going to have trouble in your life at some point. So look at the story here. You know, Jesus is, of course, he's preaching to the multitude, and then, you know, he's, he's talking. It's actually a great story on faith. You know, just a, a side note, it's a great chapter in the Bible on faith. You know, he talks to the centurion first, and he just tells everyone how great that the faith of this centurion is, and relates that to how, you know, people that are not Jews are going to get saved and ha can have faith in Jesus. But look, then, you know, you have some people come up to him and say, hey, we want to follow you. But he tells them, you know, there's going to be trouble. Like, I don't have a place to sleep. You know, and he's just saying, you know, let, you know one guy wants to go back and bury his father. He's like, look, you know, that, there's no time for that type of thing. He's like, this is serious business. If you're going to follow me, it's serious business. So then him and the disciples get into a ship and they head out in the water, out into the sea. And Jesus uses this as a teachable moment in the Bible. You know, then Jesus, of course, you know, the wind and the sea rises, and Jesus then rebukes the wind and the sea and actually fixes the actual problem. I mean, I wish you could fix problems like Jesus fixed problems, but, uh, you know, Jesus fixed the problem. But before he fixed the problem, it's important to note that Jesus used the problem as a teachable moment for the disciples. And as we go through the sermon, I want to show you that, you know, that moment that Jesus was teaching the disciples was actually something that was very important that he would teach again and again and how important it was and the reason that he was teaching that lesson to the disciples. Look, Jesus didn't do anything by accident, okay? I mean, he knew everything that was going to happen. He knew the lessons that needed to be taught to the disciples and why they needed to learn those lessons. So the first point I have this morning is that, you know, it's a, it's a prerequisite. And a lot of these points, most of these points actually, are going to be things that you need to look at, things that you need to think about before you actually have problems, okay? So the first pre-point is, is this. If you never do anything, you're never going to have any problems. 
That's the first point. Where, I mean, think about this. Where were the disciples heading with Jesus? Look back at verse number 18. Look back at verse number 18 of Matthew chapter 8. The Bible says, Now when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave commandment to depart unto the other side. And a certain scribe came unto him and said, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And another disciple said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said unto him, Follow me, and let the dead bury their dead. Pay special attention now to verse number 23, however. What did the disciples do that ended up getting in trouble? They ended up getting in trouble in the sea. Look where it says, and it says, When he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. So they were literally, you know, we talk about this, and you may have people talk to you about this when you're out soul winning. You know, oh, you need to follow Jesus. They were literally following Jesus here. They literally got into this situation out on the sea because they followed Jesus. Period. Now turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now let me ask you this. Is everybody, is everybody in our lives that we meet, even in this church, going to follow Jesus in their life? Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. Because the Bible says that something very specific will happen to you if you follow Jesus. And the Bible says this in 2 Timothy 3, 12. It says, yea, and all that will what? All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's saying that all that live godly in Christ Jesus, that's all that follow Jesus will have trouble, is what that is saying. It's saying, look, if you follow Jesus, that's a, is that not exactly what happened to the disciples here? It's almost like it was a teachable moment that Jesus was trying to show them. They're like, look, if you follow me, there's going to be storms. If you follow me, there's going to be trouble. If you never, look, if you never do anything, you're never going to have trouble. I mean, this is true in the Christian life, but it's also true in life. Look, if you never drive a boat 25 miles out into the ocean, you're never going to have trouble out there. You're never going to have a boat break down when you're 25 miles offshore, ever, if you never do that. It's the same in the Christian life. If you never do anything in your Christian life, you are never going to have trouble. If you never get involved in church, if you just stay home, if you just YouTube this Christian life, you're not going to have trouble. You won't suffer any persecution because you won't be, you know, you won't go through any tribulation. You're like, hey, sounds good. I don't want to go through tribulation. But here's the downside. Here's the downside. You say, I'm just going to YouTube this thing. I'm not going to get involved. I'm not going to sell out in this Christian life. I'm not going to actually follow Jesus because I don't want trouble in my life. I mean, raise, hand, raise your hand if you want trouble in your life. Nobody wants trouble. Nobody goes and looks for trouble. But Jesus is just saying, look, if you follow me, you're going to have it. You're just going to have it. But here's the thing. If you say, sounds good, I'm just not going to do anything in my life, you know, you will never do anything great with your life. You will never find out what you're capable of. And what's worse, you know, the Bible says, tribulation worketh patience, and patience what? Experience. If you never step out in your Christian life, you will never gain any experience at all. In your Christian life. And look, You'll ne and, and if that's the case, you'll never be able to handle anything. If any kind of, if you never step out and you never gain that experience, you'll, I mean, the smallest thing could happen to you and just knock you out of your Christian life. Know anybody like that? There's a lot of people like that. You'll never get that experience. Look, I used to have, since we're using, you know, boating analogies, I used to have a sailboat many years ago, back when I was young, like 20 years ago. And there was always these guys in the docks that, like, if there was one cloud in the sky, they would never take their sailboat out. And I was always the one where it's, like, forecasting rain, and I'm, like, motoring out to the middle of the lake. And I'm like, well, how are you going to know how to, how to sail in high winds and how to, how to handle types of situations like that if you never... I mean, look, you could, you could say that that was stupid in some situations. But the point is, how are you ever going to know if you never go through anything? You're never going to gain any experience with anything. I mean, how else would you know how to do it? If you've never done anything in your Christian life, you're never going to know how to handle anything. You'll never get any experience. And that's what the Bible says in Romans chapter 5. Second point, on dealing with problems. And this is kind of a side note, 
But look, the second point on dealing with problems, and it was pretty easy for the disciples to do this one. If you look at verse number 25, the second point on dealing with problems in your life, dealing with trouble in your life, is this. It's deciding if it's your problem. The first thing that you should do before you deal with a problem or deal with trouble is just decide, is this my problem? Is this trouble that pertains to me? Look at verse 25. This was pretty easy for the disciples to personally identify with this problem. And his disciples came to him and awoke him saying, Lord, save us. We perish. Look, when, it, when you're out in the middle of the sea and things are going wrong, it's pretty easy to personally identify with that problem. However, turn to Proverbs chapter 22. You can't, can't you say today that there are plenty of people that create problems that don't exist? First of all, Amen. look at Proverbs chapter 20 and look at verse number 3. Or even worse, I mean, people that create problems where there is no problem, or look at Proverbs 20 and verse number 3, it is an honor for a man to cease from strife, but every fool will be meddling. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. Even worse than creating problems out of thin air where there is no problem is meddling in other people's problems, is, is getting involved in problems that don't pertain to you. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. And this is kind of interesting because remember point number one, that if you never do anything in your Christian life, you'll never have any trouble. You'll never have any issues. You'll never have any problems. But this is why the Bible relates busybodies to people that meddle to people that don't do anything. Right. You'll start to realize the connection between those three things. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse number 15. Now remember point number one. If you don't ever do anything in your Christian life, you're never going to have any trouble. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in what? In other men's matters. Go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Other men's matters means other men's issues. That means other men's trouble. It's easy to see why being a busybody is directly linked to those that do no work. It's totally easy to see. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse number 10. And this is just a side note on trouble. Don't create trouble where there's, there's none. And don't meddle in trouble that doesn't pertain to you. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse number 10. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. So we have somebody here that's not working. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. So here's people that are doing no work. They have no trouble, so they're getting involved in other people's trouble. They're people that, you know... Look, and this is true, whether it be in the life for the Lord or your secular life or whatever. People that just don't have much going on, they're just the ones always causing trouble in other people's business because they don't have anything on there. Turn to Proverbs chapter 26. So they start, they don't have anything going on, so they start meddling in the trouble of others. Look at Proverbs chapter 26. People who are not busy become busy bodies. Think of it that way. Or even worse, in Proverbs 26, look at verse number 20. Where, the Bible says, Where no wood is, there the fire goeth out. So where there is no talebearer, the strife seeth it. So what's even worse is they meddle in the strife of others, and then they just throw fuel on the fire to problems. They start creating trouble where there's no trouble. You know, they take a small thing, maybe, and they fan the flames and turn it into something big. I mean, did you hear about so-and-so? And, you know, all the time they're making things worse by getting involved and meddling with things that aren't their business. Busybodies. And it's because they have nothing to do. And the Bible tells us, look, if you have nothing to do, you'll have no trouble. So you'll start just kind of looking around and just finding trouble and fanning trouble. This is what happens. I mean, the Bible tells us this. And how many times have you seen this? I'm sure you can all think of, of situations that you've seen this. Because look, once you start doing things in your life, once you start doing things in your life, you're going to realize two things. You're going to realize that there's simply, there's simply no time to make trouble where no trouble exists. That's the first thing. And then you're going to realize this. You will have zero interest 
in getting involved in problems that do not pertain to you. Because look, you got your own problems. I mean, if you are, are involved in your life and involved in your Christian life, look, you're going to have problems. You're like, this is really optimistic. This is really motivating. Look, this is true. This is the Bible. This is the other side of the prosperity gospel. Okay? This is, the, this is what the prosperity gospel leaves out. Once you start hitting it in this Christian life, you're going to have some issues. Look, God's going to bless you. You're going to be right with the Lord. But you're going to have some tribulation. That's tribulation from the world, not from God. You're going to have some tribulation. You're going to have some issues. You're going to have people that maybe don't like what you're doing, that are trying to stop. Look, there's a, I mean, there's a spiritual war going on. There's a spiritual war. And once you start getting involved in that war, you're going to take some hits. You're going to take some shots. And you're going to realize that when you're taking these hits and shots, which the blessings of the Lord come along with that, by the way. And it way outweighs any, any of the any of the negative. But once you start getting involved in that fight in your Christian life, you will simply just, you will lose interest in all this stupid stuff that's not even trouble. That has not, and it, it, it's that, that's problems that don't pertain to you and things that aren't problems. You'll just, you'll start to look at things and say, oh yeah, that, that, that's, that's silly. You'll start to see things for what they are. So if you're constantly just looking around and kind of like, always being negative and always like being negative about other people. This might be you. Maybe you need to get involved in the Christian life. If you're constantly just being negative about you know, other people that have nothing to do with you, maybe you're not, enough, you're not involved enough in your Christian life yourself. Because you're looking around for trouble where none exists. For trouble that doesn't pertain to you, you're trying to take on for yourself. Hey, get your own trouble. Get your own trouble. And, and, and here's another thing. Once you start getting involved in things in life and start getting involved in things in your Christian life, you're going to realize, you know, first of all, you're going to get experience with other people meddling in your stuff. And you're never going to want to do it to somebody else. I mean, here's a small... I mean, just imagine, imagine a, a, a stressful situation you found yourself in. And imagine how it would make you feel. Or maybe it's happened to you when somebody comes up to you, you're trying to work through this problem, and someone's you know, coming up to you, and they're, you know, you're stressed out, you're trying to just work through something, and somebody's coming up to you and being like, man, that's bad. Whoa, that, that's horrible. What, what happened there? You know, I mean, it's annoying. It makes things worse. I mean, look, it's distracting when you're trying to actually get through something. A small example you know, since we're talking about crab camp, is we're at the camp on, I don't remember which night it was, but we're at the camp, and I'm cleaning fish, and we're boiling crabs. Okay, so I got a lot going on. Garrett's got a timer. I don't know how to do this. I've never boiled crabs before. We're boiling crabs. You got to get it just right. We got the seasoning. We got the timers going. And then these people from the campsite next door, I mean, I'm trying to clean these fish so I can get, you know, all this ice ready for the crabs when they come out of the boiling pot. I mean, look, it's like a kitchen situation. It's complicated. It's stressful. I'm trying to get this done. And these people come up and they're just like, hey, what are you doing there? Oh, that's neat. And they just start pointing at it. I mean, this is a small example. But they're distracting me. And I'm just like, and, and just the, the fish. I mean, Garrett was like videotaping me cleaning fish. And I just butchered this fish as these people were talking to me. This poor fish. Because they distracted me. I was trying to work through something. They distracted me. They made the situation worse, right? I mean, that's a small example, but it throws you off is the point I'm trying to make. So once you see things from this type of perspective, look, you will never want to do that to somebody else. When you see somebody working a problem or working through something and you've done it yourself, you will never want to meddle in other people's affairs. Because you can say, hey, you know, I've been there. You know, I've been that guy trying to fix problems like that. And, you know, there's nothing that you can do that, you know, that makes it worse than just be a busybody and meddle in somebody else's affairs, right? That's why it's people that don't work that do that, because they don't have that, they don't have that experience themselves that, that knows how annoying that is and how, how, you know, distracting that is. So, the third point is another prerequisite to trouble. So point number one was what? Step out in your Christian life. Step out in your life, and you're going to have trouble. Period. You know, the second step is, is this, to a prerequisite to having trouble. You better have faith that you can get through it before you get into it. 
And that's kind of what Matthew chapter 8 was teaching, what Jesus was teaching the disciples. That's what he was teaching the disciples when he talked to them about the centurion. That's what he was teaching them when he talked to the people before they got in the boat. And that's what he was teaching them before he fixed the storm in the boat. Three separate times he taught this lesson in Matthew chapter 8. Before the trouble comes up, go to verse 26. Before the trouble comes up, and you know it's coming, right? Because you're like, you know what, I'm stepping out in this life. I'm stepping out in this Christian life, and I'm going to kill this thing. I'm going to go after it. You know trouble's coming. So do a faith check. Do a faith check. Look at Matthew chapter 8 and verse 26. And he saith unto them, Why are ye, fe why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Look, these guys, they went out in the middle of the sea with no faith. I mean, what are you doing? That's what he's saying. He's like, you went out in the middle of the sea with no faith, or lack of faith, or little faith, and they're just fearful. Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. The worst thing that you can do when a problem arises is panic and be afraid, yep. is what Jesus is explaining here. This goes for situations in life. This goes for situation in the Christian life as well. And this is where your faith comes in. Don't embark on this Christian life with no faith. With no faith. Look, turn to Matthew chapter 14. If you embark on this Christian life, if you say, I'm going to embark on this Christian journey, and I'm going to get involved, and I'm going to become, I'm going to get, in, I'm going to sell out for church, and I'm going to become a soul winner, and I'm going to win souls to Christ, and you have zero faith, that the Lord can carry you through, you won't last. That's right. You will fall out of the Christian life. I think, I, I know that this is the number one reason that people quit the Christian life. Because they get into the Christian life and trouble comes and they can't handle it and they quit. Because they don't have faith that God can carry them through. They don't have faith that that the Lord can get them through the trouble. I mean, it doesn't really make... Look, from a logical perspective, maybe I'm too logical sometimes, but it makes no logical sense. But it happens all the time. People say, I'm, I'm doing this thing, and they go in head first. This is your... Look, this is your bottle rocket Christian. Or, you know, psst, pop, done. This is what happens. You're like, I'm, this seems like a good idea. I mean, I'm going to sell out. That's what the Bible says to do. The Bible says I should follow Jesus, that I should live godly in Christ Jesus. And that's what I'm going to do. Trouble comes, I'm done. Pop. That's the number one reason people quit the Christian life. Maybe it's some quit after two months, some quit after a year, some quit after three years, but that's the reason right there. I mean, it boils it down right there. Look at Matthew chapter 14. This is the, this is the lesson Jesus was teaching the disciples. This, it, he could not have bottle rocket Christians. He wasn't going to be around. He's constantly, teachable moment, teachable moment, teachable moment. Hey, life is one sewer problem after another. Teachable moment, teachable moment. That's, he's like, you have to be strong because I'm not going to be here anymore. Look at Matthew chapter 14 and verse number 22. Here's another, here's another time where they get into a ship again. Later down the road, they get into a ship again. And straightway, Jesus constrained His disciples to get into a ship and go before Him unto the other side. Well, He sent the multitudes away. And when, they had sent, when He had sent the multitudes away, He went up into a mountain apart to pray. So He sends them off in a ship this time by themselves. He's not with them. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves. Here we go again. For the wind was contrary. And the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out in fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come thee onto the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink. And he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth, stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O ye of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Turn to Mark chapter 6. 
So Peter gets out of the boat, but it's interesting because he sends them out into another storm. If you go to Mark chapter 6 and look at verse number 48, you'll see a different, um, a little bit more detail on this same story. And look, they did much better this time. He sends them out by themselves and they get into a storm again and they weren't afraid of the storm this time. Look at uh, Mark 6, 48. This is when Jesus walks up to them and He saw them toiling and rowing. For the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night, He cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. So they did much better here. They were at least working to get out of it. They weren't afraid of the actual weather itself here. You know, they were afraid of this guy walking on the water towards them. So they were, I mean, they were not panicking. Of course, then He steps it up a notch and tells, hey, get out of the boat and walk on the water. And then, they, you know, the fear set in again. So it's just another lesson. But look, Jesus was preparing these guys for what was to come. Can you not see that? Everything being a teachable moment. He's building their faith. He's stepping up the situations that He puts them through. I mean, if they never got into the ship, think about it in Matthew chapter 8. If they never got into the ship, where did they go? They got on the ship to go where? To the other side? To the country of where? To the country of the Gergesons? What happened over there? What happened over there? Jesus casts out legion. Many demons. Jesus casts out. He does this great miracle. And it's right after He lectures them on what? Faith. Now, what does it take to fight demons? Just curious. If you've read the Bible, let me just answer it for you. To fight demons, you know what it takes? It takes faith. Turn to Matthew chapter 17. Turn to Matthew chapter 17. I want to walk you through what Jesus was showing them and why He was showing them what He did at that time. Look at Matthew chapter 17. We see a case here where the disciples were trying to cast out a demon, but they could not. And Jesus ends up doing it for them. Look at Matthew chapter 17. Look at verse 15. Just remember, what does it take to fight demons? The answer is right here. Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is lunatic and sore vexed. For oftentimes he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? He's like, look. He's like, I'm not going to be here forever. He's like, I'm not going to be here. He's like, you guys have got to get it right. You guys have got to understand. He's like, bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. And then the disciples came to Jesus apart and said, why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto him, because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible to you. He knew that they would have to deal with trouble, especially when he was gone. And he was teaching them that the prerequisite to dealing with the trouble that they're dealing with is faith. And look, he's teaching them that in the moment that they were in the sea, they lacked faith for their defense. Because they were in trouble and their faith would have brought them through. But they're going to need that faith because they're going to need to go on the offense. You need faith for defense in your life against trouble. When the persecution comes, when the tribulation comes, you need that faith for defense. But guess what? Once you have that faith, then it becomes your offense in this spiritual war that we are fighting together. As you become, look, can you be, can you be a soldier for Christ if you have no faith? If you can't even get past the, the faith defending you from trouble you're going through? How will you ever get to the battlefield? If you're walking to the battlefield and it's two miles away and you stub your toe and you start crying and you go home because you have no faith that God can take care of your, your little toe, how is He going to keep you in the battle? How are you going to fight? That's what He's showing them. He's showing them you go out in the ship and you have no faith. You can't cast out demons. You can't fight because you have no faith. Because to cast out demons, to fight this spiritual war, He's like, if you have faith, you can fight anything. Amen. Period. Turn to Proverbs chapter 21. Your faith protects you in times of trouble, but then it casts out demons and fights the darkness of this world. 
Turn to Proverbs chapter 21. So we know. What do we know? We know that if we never do anything, we will never have trouble. We know that we need to check our faith before embarking. Now here's another one. Turn to Proverbs chapter 21 and look at verse number 31. Another prerequisite to dealing successfully with trouble is this. You need to prepare for trouble. You need to be ready for trouble. Look at Proverbs 21, 31. The Bible says, The horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. Look, we always say safety is of the Lord, but the horse is prepared against the day of battle. Look, you don't want to hear a clunk in the motor when you're out to sea. But you know what? I had another motor. I had another motor. I told Garrett two weeks ago when we were tuning up this second motor, I told him, I was like, you see me taking this thing out and putting it on, it's all gone wrong. I never had to put that second motor on. But the point is, is that you need to be prepared for trouble. We need to be prepared for trouble. That's why we have soul, look, that's why we have soul winning tips on safety. That's why we do things a certain way when we go out into neighborhoods. Keep an eye on the ladies. We, we navigate um, streets and blocks a very specific way. We pair people up in a very specific way. Because look, we're just preparing the horse for battle. You know, we talk about safety with animals, safety with dogs. You know, we try to be smart, right? We try to be smart out there. We're preparing the horse for battle. We want to be prepared. I mean, ultimately, we know that our safety is in God's hands. Ultimately. But the Bible does say that we should be prepared as much as we possibly can be. Okay, so now, those are the prerequisites. So now, you know, how do we actually deal with problems? How do you deal with problems? You know, you see, now you have faith. You have faith. Your faith is strong. You know, you're prepared. Now the problem actually arises. You know, what do you do? I mean, it's pretty simple from here. You know, you just take it one step at a time. You just work it one step at a time. We're out in the middle of the ocean, and Jacob says to me, he's like, are, are, when are we going to fix this? When we get home, and you know, where are we going to take it to get fixed, and where, how are we going to fix this? And I'm just like, hey, one step at a time, let's get, you know, step one, let's get back to Monterey Bay. Step one. Step two, let's rescue the crab gear that's out in Monterey Bay. And then step three, let's get back to the marina. And then we'll think about fixing the problem. Then, I mean, once you break it in, look, one foot in front of the other when you get yourself in trouble. That's the bottom line. Just fight the monster in front of you. Don't be looking at the 10 monsters behind him. Because that's when you get overwhelmed and panic. Just one step after another. What were the disciples doing in the second storm that they got into? They were rowing. They were toiling. They were just trying to, they were trying to fight the contrary winds, the problem that was in front of them. And they were just, get, it's, it's when you get into yourself in trouble is when you start looking three steps ahead, when you start looking four steps ahead, or when you start taking the whole picture by itself and then you panic and you, and you freak out. It's just one foot in front of the other. I remember this is a, a small example that I thought about, but Brother Stuckey, Brother Stuckey is like this super soccer player. And he's like, I don't know, he's like almost went professional or something. He's like awesome at soccer. So we played soccer all the time. I hate soccer. We played soccer all the time at Verity. And there was a time we were playing soccer. And when Brother Stucky's coming down the field with the ball, everyone just backpedals and just runs back as fast as they possibly can. Because he's super fast and he's, he's super good at soccer. So everyone's just backpedaling because he's just ready to blast through everybody. But he was coming at us one time. And I was like, you know what, I'm just going to go after him. And I went right after him, and by some miracle, I just took a swipe as I ran full speed after him, and I stole the ball perfectly from him. <laughs> and he's running that way, everybody's running that way, and all I could see was the other goal, was Brother Stucky's goal right behind me, and there was nobody there. There wasn't even the goalie there. Everybody was gone. And all I could visualize in my head was myself scoring a goal against Brother Stucky. And I'm like, this is the most amazing moment. And number one, I was talking trash and I was laughing so hard I could barely breathe, but I forgot to actually put one foot in front of the other and I fell flat on my face. And everybody laughed, but I was like, I just, I, I envisioned myself scoring the goal and I forgot to move my legs. 
It's a small, silly example, but you just take one step at a time when you get into trouble, when you have problems. You just break it into steps. It's very effective, and the situation always looks better when you're just like, what can I do as step one? How do I get to step one? And you just start grinding through it one step at a time. It's very simple. So in conclusion, this morning, we're talking about trouble. You know, we had some this weekend. We had some trouble. But a guy I worked with many years ago, he was an older guy. He was an older guy in his 60s. And I was working with this guy, and I came into work one morning, and I was, I was walking into the plant, and he saw me, and, and uh, he, saw, he must have saw something in my face that I was stressed out about something. And he asked me, he said, I, I was stressed out about the project or whatever I was working on with him. And he said, you know, you look, you look stressed out. You know, you look like you have, you have trouble. You know, I was like, yeah, you know, I, I do. And he said, well, he says to me, he says, you know what? He said, can money fix it? And I said, yeah, you know, money can fix it because it's a problem at work and it's an issue with a project. And he looks at me and he says, then it's not really a problem, is what he said. And so this was a guy that you know had had some trouble in his life that was actual trouble. So I know that I'm giving you an example uh, this weekend about boat issues and sewer problems and all things like this. These are nice analogies. These are nice teachable moments. They're nice ways to get some experience with things, but they're not really problems is what I'm getting at. Ultimately, when you think of problems that affect life and the health of your loved ones, things like this, it's really that first prerequisite of faith that counts with you in your life. I mean, because look, I mean, you can prepare. You can prepare. I mean, a lot of the things that we talked about, um, you know, things that happened this weekend, a lot of things, examples I gave you, you can prepare for going out on the ocean. You know, you can prepare for going on a long hike. You can prepare for, you know, going on overnight trips and camping. But other problems, serious problems in your life, you may just have to rely on faith. Amen. Turn back to Matthew chapter 17. And that may be what you have to get you through. And this is why Jesus focused on faith in all these examples and all these lessons that he was giving to the disciples is because ultimately when there's real trouble, when there's real problems, that's what you need. Look at back at Matthew 17. And I didn't read this verse for you because I wanted to save it for here, but ultimately Jesus said this. So you said, you know, I just have to rely on my faith, and is there really action for me at that point? But yes, there is action, and Jesus gives you that action right here. Matthew 17, 21, he says, you couldn't, you, you couldn't cast out the demon because you, had little, you didn't have strong enough faith, is what he's saying. He's like, in addition to that, here's what you can do. And he says, Howbeit this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. So there are things that we can do in times of trouble. That, I mean, there are things that we can do in times of trouble that are completely out of our hands. So you're like, this is out of my hands. There's a health issue with a loved one, whatever. But this is action that you can take. Prayer and fasting. That's what you should be doing in times of trouble. You should pray. And yes, you should fast in times of trouble. I mean, look, appeal to the Lord to intervene for you. And by the way, you know, don't let your prayer life begin when you have serious trouble. Here's the thing. We prayed for a safe return before we left. You should have a prayer life. You should have a relationship with God. So God, you know, you're not like, you know, dialing 911 with God and he's like, Jared who? Haven't heard from you in like five years. What, what's the problem? What, who, where do you live now? I mean, not that God's like that, obviously, but my point is that you should have a prayer life. You shouldn't just hit the emergency buzzer with God and that's the only time you pray. But the Bible does say that, you know, when disaster strikes, you should pray. Amen. You should pray for God. Look, now you're, you're asking God to intervene for you. And I mean, that's why, that's another reason you need to be in the right standing with the Lord. Because when you do call for help, you want God to be like, oh, that's, you know, that's, that's Brother Ryan. Uh, you know, I just talked to him yesterday for half an hour. And I, just, I talked to him once a day, 
and you know he's you know he's in good relationship with his heavenly father and he needs help right now and we're just going to get him out I'm going to get him out of this you want to have a good standing with your heavenly father I mean look I want to be on the Lord's side I mean because I'm going to need him on my side period I mean, I need, I am going to need God to intervene for me in my life. I don't know about you, but I know that. I know that. So I want this strong relationship with the Lord. Amen. And I know that, look, I know especially, I mean, don't, I mean, once again, don't be the children of Israel that just goes in the midst of all your enemies and then forgets about the Lord and now your enemies come and just crush you. I mean, if you're going to go out and you're going to step out in the midst of your enemies, you better, I mean, everything's fine as long as you have that relationship with the Lord. Everything's fine because guess what? He will fight for you and he will win. Period. So that relationship with the Lord is so important. To step out in your Christian life and to forget about God, I mean, it doesn't, it's not logical, first of all. It doesn't make any sense to do that. To like, hey, I'm going to do all these things. I mean, why are you doing it? You're doing it for the Lord. I mean, you're not doing it to get to heaven. You're doing it for the Lord. He saved you. You're going to heaven because of Him. I mean, you're doing it for Him. Why would you not? I mean, get that relationship right. And then He will fight for you. And then in times of real trouble, that faith, your relationship with God, your prayer life, that's going to come into play. And then He will intervene for you. So make sure that that relationship and this prayer life of yours is healthy this morning. Because trouble is inevitable, my friends. Trouble is inevitable. Life is just one sewer problem after another. And some problems, especially problems in your Christian life, can be serious. And you need the Lord fighting with you. And if you have the Lord fighting with you and fighting for you, everything's fine. Amen. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.